Good evening, and welcome back to our weekly uh, Bible learning class, our class on Nevi'im, on the prophets. And we began with Yoshua, <clears throat> the book of Joshua, in which everything seemed to be going pretty well, following God, following Moses, conquering the land, settling the land. And then we started with Shoftim, Judges, where it started out okay, and then all of a sudden took a turn for the worse, and it kept on going down and down and down until the last chapter of Shoftim. There was an all-out civil war because of the moral uh, immorality of how people treated each other, which is a reflection of how um, uh, dis disunified the uh, the nation was disunified, ununified, um, and um, and the 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 the, the book says ish at that time anyone did whatever they want and that's chaos, anarchy, and uh, as a result we started our story of Shmuel, which seeks to uh, unite which Shmuel does, and to restore, which Shmuel does, and to regain that uh, connection with God, that God should guide the Israelites in their actions, which Shmuel did. Of course, it started with the destruction of uh, Shiloh, the loss of the Ark, uh, the killing of, uh, uh, of Chochni and Pinchas, the dying of Eli, the, the, the Kohen, and the Ark goes to the Plishtim, and then it goes to Beit Shemesh, and then it goes to Kiryat Yari. It's searching for its final resting place, which David will, will, will bring it to. And, um, and then the people come to Shmuel, and they say, we, we need a king. Now, this is a, an interesting idea, because on the one hand, Shmuel um, wants the people to be united. On the other hand, uh, they say, we need a king like all the other nations. So kind of leaves a sour taste. And that's what Shmuel is concerned about. You know, are you going to having a king because you all want to unite Brown and be united in together? That's a good thing. Doing it for the wrong reasons, that's a very bad thing. So um, we have then... Um, Shmuel anointing Shaul. In the beginning, the story with Shaul is a very interesting uh, personality. On the one hand, he looks like he's supposed to be a king. He seems simple, and there's nothing negative in the beginning of the story. He seems to be okay, and then he seems to have the spirit of God, which he kind of joins together a troop of, uh, of prophets, and then he starts to prophesy. I'm not exactly sure to what extent, but nevertheless, this is what God has chosen. And we're always kind of wondering, did God choose Saul because he was the right one? Or did God choose Saul because he, that's what the people wanted? Now, the truth is, the people don't exactly love him right from the start. Uh, even though Samuel uh, anoints him in chapter 10, um, he, uh, he kind of goes back and, uh, and, 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 you know, goes back to his private life. In fact, um, there are some people who, uh, who are against Shaul altogether. If we look at the last verses of chapter 10, he says, listen, I found you a king. His name is Shaul. He's the choice of God. And verse 24, a lot of people say, okay, Mishich Mala, he's head and shoulders above everyone. He looks great. This is what God has chosen. And a lot of the nations, he was, yay, king, long live the king. Comes verse 25, Samuel told the people the rules of the monarchy and recorded them and sent the people back to their homes. And Saul also went to his home. But some scoundrel said, how can this fellow save us? And they scorned him and brought him no gift. And he pretended not to mind, which means that there was a uh, struggle 
for asserting his right, divine right, to be the king. Now, the people who didn't like him said, listen, until he shows us what a king is, you know, what he's made out of, well, why should we, you know, accept him? A skirmish here, he's successful a little bit there. Not enough. So, um, so then we have chapter 11. Chapter 11, we do uh, meet uh, a, a, a foe. We meet Nachash the Ammoni. And Ammon, remember, is on the eastern side today, modern day Jordan, like South Jordan, okay? Ammon is uh, part of Ammon and Moab. These are two nations that ultimately came from Lot, if you remember. Lot had two illegitimate sons named Ammon and Moab. And um, actually, we were told not to engage in them and let, let them you know, be there and not to take over their lands. But Nachash, who, by the way, means snake, so his name is Nachash, and he uh, encroaches. He, he comes and, uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> tries, to, uh, tries to, he comes with his big army and he says to the Israelites who are there in, in the place called Yavesh Gilad, I'm taking over and I'm going to kill you all unless you make a pact with us. And this pact isn't like an equal, you know, uh, peace for peace uh, accord. It's rather you make a pact to, to accept me as your, you know, uh, a ruler, and I won't kill you. But you have to do it on one condition. What's the, the condition? Verse 2, everyone has to gouge out their right eye and that will be humiliating for, for all of Israel. So, it, you know, it's not all of Israel that's being uh, conquered. It's, it, it's a, a place called Yavesh Gilad, but a lot of the, the, the elders there, the Israelites, are very nervous. So they say to Ammon, give us seven days, and we will send out messengers to see if someone's going to come to our aid, right? This is the point. Do the, is, the Israelites act as one, and, if, and therefore they're responsible one for the other. And if they hear down up in the north that, that, that in Yavesh Gilad, on the eastern side, there's, uh, there's an enemy, that they all rally around and they'll come. Or at least let there be a judge, like during the time of the Shoftim. Well, let's see what happens. The, the Malachim, the messengers, go to Shaul, and they say, uh, they start crying. They say, this is what's going on, not too far from here. So Shaul comes and he says, why are you crying? And they tell him what happened. And verse 6, the Spirit of God gripped Saul, and his anger blazed up. I have to try to understand the relationship between the Spirit of God and Saul's anger, and it'll come into play a lot more later on in Saul, Shaul's um, personality, it seems very positive in this sense, right? The Spirit of God, right? Um, here's what he does, verse 7. He takes a yoke of an ox and he cuts them into pieces. And then he sends each piece to all the tribes. And he says, I'm going to destroy, basically, all of your cattle if you don't follow Saul and Samuel into battle. And the terror of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. Ah, so this is the job of the king, to strike fear into the nation so that they come out and they fight, even when they're far away from the enemy. So he seems to have succeeded by terror, by sending terror to them and saying, you better, you better come, and they all came out. How many people came out? 330,000. That's a very re respectful number. So they said to the, uh, to the messengers, tell the people of Yavesh Gilad, tomorrow, redemption, salvation. People of Yavesh Gilad uh, hear about this. And they, he sets up for, for battle. 
And not only that, but they said, who are those people? They were so impressed with Shaul. And who are those people that wanted to say that Shaul shouldn't be the king? We're going to kill them. Um, I'm sorry, in verse 11, they defeat Ammon. So, so Shaul's first test is a big success. So much so that they want to uh, root out all of the people who, who rebelled against the idea of Shaul. And then look what happens in the end in verse 14. Lechu v'nelchal Gilgal. Let's go to a place called Gilgal, which is an important place in Jewish history. That's where they crossed into when they came from Egypt. We will, in a more public um, display, we will inaugurate the monarchy. And everyone went and they offered sacrifices and everyone was happy and everything worked out just fine. Now in verse, in chapter 12, Shmuel is always still nervous about how they understand what it means to be, to have a king. So he said to them, um, you know, I guess these are the end of his life type of thing. And he's saying, you know, I did everything for you guys and I never uh, um, wronged you. And God is my witness that just as Moses, Mo, Moses and Aaron took you out of Egypt and brought you here and the people, there was a relationship, you know, the people turned to God and God sent a messenger or sent a, a prophet and, and God helped you out. And when that didn't happen in verse nine, when they forget God, then he sells them into slavery by these other nations like the Sisra and the Plishtim. But then we know the process. They, they say we, we, we sinned and help us now. And God sends Yerubal and he sends Bedan and he sends Yiftach and he sends Shmuel. And don't you see how Nachash, the king of Ammon, came to you and you said, no. And you told me we want a king to reign over us. Here's your king. God gave you a king. Now, if you follow the proper rules of what it means to have a king and you not rebel against him, then um, this, will be, this exper experiment will be successful. Verse 15, but if you don't and you reject and you rebel, then um, you're going to see what God is going to do. Samuel then asks God for a sign to show the people that he's the real thing. And he says, ask for thunder and lightning and rain. And uh, there was rain and everyone was very fearful. And, um, and they were so frightened, they, they asked Samuel for, uh, to pray for them. And Samuel says in verse 20, have no fear. You have indeed done these wicked things because you, 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 in fact, had the wrong attitude and the wrong reasons for um, wanting a king. And that's what he's trying to drive home the point, perhaps pointing to Shaul and saying, you wanted a king because he should look like that. But that's not why you, you get a king. You need a king because he should be the messenger of God. To have a, however, have no fear, verse 22. <clears throat> For God is not going to give up on you. He'll never abandon his people. So you should continue to fear God. And if you don't, then you and your, your king will be swept away. In uh, chapter 13, um, Samuel, Shaul is starting out his, uh, his um, monarchy. And after a few years already uh, getting his feet wet, he chooses. Now, remember that there was a constant enemy. Okay. Who was the constant enemy? Yeah, there was Nachash who came once in a while, and there was Yavin. Who was the constant enemy? The answer is the Plishtim, the Philistines. 
So Shaul, uh, in addition to start having a skirmish with the people, with, with the nation of uh, Ammon, is trying to deal with the Plishtim who are, who are in his own um, territory. Remember, Shaul's in, let's say, in the, the Giva, near Yerushalayim, around the center of the land. But who's on the coast? And they're constantly encroaching. It's the Plishtim. So what does Shaul do? Now we're introduced to Shaul's son, which is going to be, he's an important personality. His name is Yonatan. Okay. He chooses 3,000 who are his best soldiers, say. Okay. He gives 1,000 to Yonatan. And they go and attack the Nitziv Plishtim. And it seemed Plishtim was like the ruler, you know, of the Philistine, uh, who, who was sent by the Philistines to rule, you know, uh, a portion of the land that they had conquered. And um, so he went and he, he killed him. Now, the Philistines weren't, thrilled, weren't happy about this at all. So they respond in verse 5. They come with their full force, 30,000 chariots, 30,000 chariots. I, I can't even fathom that number, but maybe it was an exaggeration with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 uh, horsemen, troops as numerous as the sand. And they come to Mich Michmash. And um, obviously, when the Israelites see what uh, what's awaiting them they are frightened and this this is over a long period of time it's not just one day and they see that these skirmishes are taking place and the philistines keep fortifying themselves and fortifying themselves and taking control over more of the land so what did they do in verse six the people hid in caves in rocks and tunnels some hebrews crossed the jordan to the territory of God and Gilat. Now, where was Saul? He was in Gilgal. And uh, he didn't know what was going on necessarily. So they, uh, the people alerted him. Now, Saul realizes, oh my, there's a, there's a battle that's going, that has to take place with the police team. What do you do as a king when there's a battle that needs to take place? The answer is, you wait for the prophet. If you don't wait for the prophet, you're going to be in trouble. When you, what, why wouldn't he wait for the prophet? That's the question. So look what happens in verse <clears throat> 8. He waited seven days. Shmuel doesn't come yet. And the people start running away. Right? I mean, so, so gathered the people and they, they have a, a bit of an army and they say, we're going to go fight. And then Shmuel, and then delay, and they're waiting, and people have news comes, and oh, this is going on, and people start escaping, and Shmuel and Shaul's getting nervous and more nervous. So what, what does Shaul do? And this is his sin number one. In verse nine, he says, "I will make the burnt offering." <clears throat> now this is all types of wrong. Okay, uh, Saul, Saul is not the uh, he's not the priest. He's not the prophet. He's not the religious personality. And therefore, for him to go and make a burnt offering, he's going into areas that he does not understand. And he's doing it because he's afraid of losing all the people. This is a theme in the personality of King Saul. One of the most important attributes of a king is that he has to be confident. He has to be determined. Obviously, he has to be connected to God and connected to the prophet, but he cannot be subservient to the nation. The opposite. The nation has to be subservient to the king. So here, Shaul falls, and his failure here is, is a harbinger, which means it's a, kind of like the beginning of what is going to be an even greater failure that we'll see in the coming chapters. And Shmuel notices it. Verse 13. You acted foolishly, he says to Saul. 
You didn't keep the commandments of the Lord. It's a shame because otherwise the Lord would have established your dynasty forever. But now your dynasty will not endure. The Lord will seek out a man after his own heart and appoint him ruler over his people because you did not abide by what the Lord has commanded you. So this is why I'm, my theory here is that God's first choice was not his choice, not God's choice. It wasn't a divine decision. It was a decision of what the people would want as a king. And the, the, the guy who looks like a king doesn't act like the king of Israel. He might act like other kings, but he doesn't act like the king of Israel. As a result, King Samuel has to say, that your uh, kingship will not endure. Meanwhile, there's still a battle that has to be taken, and, and there were thousands, and as a result, all that's left is 600. And um, nevertheless, um, you know, the uh, Philistines have three different battalions, and they go to three different areas, Throughout uh, one in Derech Beit Choron, which is really like uh, from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv in the middle, is that's the Beit Choron, and one going towards the desert. And it was a struggle. And in verse 19, there's something very strange. The Philistines over the months had been um, terrorizing the Israelites so much so that they stole all, they took all of the metal. Why do they take all the metal? Because without a metal, metal, you have no sword. So the Navi tells us in verse 19 and verse 20, 21, that there were no swords. They had no spears. The Israelites had to, you know, use their plowshares. And it was a very, very sad state of affairs that it was like Shaul had a sword and Jonathan had a, his son had a sword. And the rest of uh, Israel did not have enough. But what happens in chapter 14? So in chapter 14, Jonathan, Yonatan, he's a, uh, an amazing warrior. And he has an attendant with him. And he said, you know what? Maybe I can do some trouble with these uh, on the Philistine side. He doesn't even tell his father. And, he, uh, and Saul was in a different place in Gibeah, near the place called Migron. He had the 600 people with him. And he had Achiah and a guy named Ikavod, who was the son of Pinchas, if you remember. His mother named him without honor. And he was like the priest. Remember, you need a priest when you go into battle. So they were preparing to go into battle, but no one knew that Yonatan had disappeared. Where did Yonatan go? Well, Yonatan went uh, undercover to reach the Philistine garrison. And there was a rocky uh, crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. And he, and he, uh, and he was able to go in between the two. And he said, let's cross to the outpost of those uncircumcised, which means the, the Philistines, maybe God will help us bring a victory. Just us, just the two of us. Remember, if you, it's the middle of the night. So the arms bearer said, all right, I'm following you, whatever you decide. So we'll cross over to these men and let them see us. And if they say, wait until we get to you, then we'll stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we know that God is delivering them into our hands. In other words, we're going to go behind the mountain and we're going to go, hey, you know, we're going to show our faces. Now, if they gather and they say, oh, let's fight against you. So then we know. Right? But if they say, oh, come here, means that God is doing something to help them. Now, verse 11, they both showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. And he said, look, some, they said, look, some Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have been hiding. And they said, come to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Now, this was a sign for Jonathan because he 
made the declaration that if they say come to us, it's a sign that God is with us. So Jonathan got to his hands and his feet with his arms bearer and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and they finished them all off. Now the initial attack that Jonathan and his arms bearer made accounted for some 20 men. And then terror broke out because, you know, the other Philistines that were sleeping, they woke up, they look around and they see all of a sudden, 20 of their men are dead. And they were so, so they got very scared. And the, the terror from God ensued. Now, Saul doesn't know, doesn't know this is going on. And he has his scouts at Giv'ah. And all of a sudden, they see, you know, from a perch, they see that the Philistine army is, is scattering and they're all getting nervous and they're running in different directions. So what do they do? Saul says to Achiah, bring the ark of God here. And while Saul was speaking to the priest, the confusion in the Philistine camp kept increasing. And Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. And they rushed into battle and they found the Philistines in great confusion. And every man's sword again, turns against his fellow, right? Which means that basically because of Jonathan's initiative, God wanted it so that this battle, would, they would defeat the Philistines, and that's what happened. In verse, um, the, when the people, the, the Israelites were hiding and they heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they, all, they, got, they came out and they started running after them. Thus, the Lord brought victory to Israel that day. And they fought and they, they, they ran after them. And um, there was a great um, victory that was in the making. But then listen what happens. And this is going to remind us of something that Yiftach did. In verse 24, Shaul wanted everyone to run after, because if now we have the enemy on the run, he cursed anyone who eats bread until the evening. So that, you know, because if you sit and eat bread, you're not going to continue the battle. So, um, Yonatan, his own son, didn't hear that his father made everyone swear that they wouldn't eat. And what does he do? He eats bread with the, with the, the honey that's there. And then the man tells him, Did your father made everyone swear and he cursed everyone for doing that. And Jonathan says, my father has brought trouble on the people. Now, this is a, a theme that we're, we're learning now and we're going to understand. Jonathan is righteous. Jonathan is warrior. Jonathan <clears throat> is the ideal. Whereas um, Saul, the father, it seems kind of lost and seems like he's following. And then he makes these wild curses and he does things that he shouldn't be doing with the, with the sacrifices. And the question is, how is Jonathan rewarded for being this righteous person? And we'll see he becomes very close with David. Um, and then we'll find out the fate of Jonathan. Um, so the people told Saul in verse 33, uh, the people are eating, they're sinning. Um, Saul ordered spread among the troops and one must bring me his ox and slaughter it here and not sin and eat it with the blood. So he was really trying to follow, you know, there's a law against eating the blood. So every one of the troops brought his own ox and they slaughtered it there and that night. And Saul sent that, set up an altar to God and it was the first altar he erected to the Lord. Now, in verse, the, the story continues. In verse 36, Shaul says, let's go down to the Plishtim, the Philistines, and get them in the middle of the night. And they said, okay, we'll do it. And, and then, verse 37, finally, Saul inquired of God and says, shall I go to the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hands of Israel? And God did not respond. So this is a little curious. So Shoal says, everybody come here, Udu, and you should know what happened today. For I swear in the name of God, 
the uh, south, the, the savior of Israel, um, my son Yonatan. Even if it was through my son Yonatan, he will be put to death. Which is a strange story. Remember the story of Yiftach when Yiftach made this uh, oath that he said, oh, we, anyone who comes out, and it turns out that it was his daughter. And here, Shaul is saying, anyone who does, you know, violates my words will be killed, even if my own son. And in fact, it was his own son. So... So they said it was Yonatan, and in verse 44, he says, oh, it must mean that Yonatan must die. After all, it must die. It's, uh, it's the word of God, or I said. And the people didn't understand. In verse 45, they say, Yonatan, who saved us, saved us from the, our enemy. He's going to be put to death? Never. Not a hair of his hell shall fall to the ground. For he brought this day to pass with the help of God. Thus the troops saved Jonathan and he did not die. And Saul broke off his, his pursuit of the Philistines and the Philistines returned to their home. Now, this story is a little complicated and confusing and it's meant to be. And all of these stories of Saul are meant to be, you know, he goes one step forward and then two steps back. And he makes, you know, silly mistakes that, that we don't understand. And, and he's just not ripe. And that's an important word, ripe. We always think of, you know, the, the king of Israel as David, but there was a king before, and that was Saul. And, and I can't help but wonder whether this was a trial to show the people that you don't just choose a king because he's supposed to look like a king. You follow what God's choice is because his heart is in the right place of what it means to be a king. And we'll see, unfortunately, how this manifests itself in the uh, subsequent chapters. Um, right now, uh, this is the conclusion where there's still the plishtim. There still needs to be a major battle that takes place. But show, verse 47, Saul is in control of the monarchy. And he is fighting against the other enemies in Moab, in Ammon, in Adom. And he def he's even fighting against Amalek, the nemesis of Israel. So it's not to say that Shaul did nothing. He was a great warrior. And, and it is to tell us, though, that even being a great warrior is not enough in terms of what God expects from a king. The, uh, then the Navi goes and just tells us that you should know that the sons of Saul are Yonatan Yishvi Malkishua, and his daughters are Merav and Michal, and we'll, those daughters will become important for our story, and his wife's name is Achinoam, and his general's name is Aviner Ben Ner, or Aviner Ben Ner, his uncle. And there was Kish, his father, and Nair, his uncle's father, and all the days, and this is the verse 52, um, there was bitter war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And whenever Saul noticed any stalwart man or warrior, he would take him into his service. This is leading up to the next half of the book of Samuel, which will discuss continued Saul's um, struggles with being the king and a new personality who is going to emerge, who comes into the, um, the scene that's going to be a young man named David. And we will probably be introduced to him, maybe not next class, but in the class following. This uh, ends our discussion of, from chapters 10 to chapters 14 of the book of Samuel, and um, we continue with the saga of Saul, and we will get to, in the next classes, his tragic ending of his story. 
Have a wonderful evening and thank you very much for joining and we will uh, meet at another time.